Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals to state senators to mayors to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, I talk with San Diego City Council member Raul Campillo. He's built his life around public service, from growing up in a small border town, to Harvard, to the classroom, to law and elected office. We talk about that journey and how he now fights for families by increasing access to childcare and housing. He also shares where to go for a great 24 hours in San Diego, something we should all take advantage of soon. Enjoy. San Diego Council Member Raul Campillo, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is wonderful to be speaking with you today. Thank you so much, Ryan. Happy to be here. I should note for our listeners that I am in, up in Santa Cruz, California, where we're facing gale force winds and rains. And so if you hear uh, things banging against my window behind me, know that's that's what I'm facing. And I actually know that uh, you two, Council Member, are facing an unprecedented storm right now. Can you talk a little bit about how your city is doing with this winter weather we've been having? Well, like most California cities, we got a lot of asphalt and asphalt gets potholes. Our number one concern right now is making sure that it's safe to drive to and from work or wherever you're trying to go. And we've been investing a lot in our roads. San Diego is known for its lack of infrastructure investments. That said, we're also known for having a really good accounting of how much that is. So when it comes to stormwater, wastewater, bridges, and the literal state of our streets and surfaces, we have a good sense of how much that's going to cost. And yeah, it's not looking good today, but it's going to be better tomorrow. <laughs> that's the optimism we need. But beyond the storms, can you talk a little bit about how your city is doing? San Diego, for those who haven't had the good fortune of visiting, is a beautiful city. It's a border town. It's a high-tech center. It's got a strong university system. So it's got sort of all the components to make it a really interesting city. What are the issues and opportunities that you're looking at right now? Well, I'd say that there's there's lots of good stuff going on right now in San Diego. I'm I'm personally I'm thrilled that our city and our region as a whole has bounced back economically from COVID relatively well for the median. We had a very high vaccination rate. In fact, our our South Bay region in San Diego, which has our highest population of Latinos, had an extraordinarily high uptake on on the COVID-19 vaccine. So we saw fewer than our expected cases. We saw fewer than our expected number of deaths. And we saw far more than expected tourists coming to San Diego because they knew that it was a safe place to come. And there's obviously a lot of good outdoor spaces from Balboa Park and the beaches, a lot of hiking in the, in the more eastern areas and north part of the county. So we saw a lot of folks from all over California and the Southwest come here, drive here, and spend their dollars here. So I think from that perspective, we have been able to rebound well. However, we are suffering from a significant crisis of homelessness and housing affordability like most of California is. We do not have the same numbers as San Francisco and Los Angeles counties in terms of the number of homeless individuals. But for San Diego being the second biggest city in the state, we do have a significant population. We are struggling to build affordable housing as quickly as we should. Definitely not building the permanent supportive housing that we should to help those who are significantly suffering from chronic homelessness and all the negative aspects of that related to mental health and potential substance abuse, things like that. So I'm not going to paint a good picture for San Diego. We are struggling in that regard. And it's a big part of our attention as a city to try to solve it. And we are doing things like bringing on more staff to city, to our development services department so that we can process those permits as quickly as possible. Our mayor just put forward 
a new policy that if you are building a 100% affordable complex, you will get your permits locked in in under 30 days, which is remarkable. Ameritag Gloria is doing a really strong job on this and knows how to meet the crisis head on. And he's got the support of our city council and me in particular. We are trying to put in great solutions to deal with what our voters are telling us are the biggest issues, which are homelessness and housing affordability. And then all of that is followed very closely by our infrastructure. People want the very basics of city government to be delivered. Not to go too long on this, but for about two decades, we've underfunded those aspects because in the late 90s and early 2000s, our city leaders mismanaged our pension and we have to pay that back significantly. And it takes a big chunk of our general fund budget every year to put towards that, solving that problem from decades ago. So we would be spending a lot more on those issues, but legally we cannot at the moment. But we've definitely made a lot of headway with bonds and with just prioritizing the right things. Thank you for that overview. Talk a little bit about cities have a lot of authority within their jurisdiction, but so many of the issues that you bring up are bigger than your jurisdiction, mental health, substance abuse, housing. How do you try to find the appropriate and effective role for a city in addressing these broader issues? Well, one of the big aspects that I know many other new dealers from other states, oftentimes their jurisdictional authority is sometimes far more or in some cases far less than what California has. So our counties are the deliverer of health and human services as guided by state law. Our cities are not part of that. Our cities do not have our schools. Those are independently elected school boards. And we do not have health and human services, which come from the county. Now, the city of San Diego is the seat of government and the largest city with about 1.4 million people in San Diego County, which goes east and north and down to Tijuana on the Mexican border with about 3.5 million people. Our city has the most economic activity, the most residents, and it has a, it's the largest share of problems. And so we are looking at our county and saying, how can they support us? Now, for about 50 years, our county government was very conservative, and they did not invest a lot of the money that they had on delivering health and human services. It, it's a very frustrating subject for any Democrat any person who comes who's cut from the New Deal cloth to think, hey, if you spend the money on these things, it's going to have really good social outcomes, health outcomes, economic outcomes. And so just for the first time, I think in our history in 2020, did we have a Democratic majority of our county board of supervisors? They've been spending a lot more money on health, mental health, child care, all sorts of things that are really supportive of families, families meeting their budget. And so the city, what we take on a lot more is the land use decisions, the permitting, the entitlement of property so that we can build more housing, build short-term shelters, build permanent supportive housing. But fundamentally, we don't provide the healthcare itself. So during COVID, we provided very big sites, big parking lots or facilities, and the county would typically send in nurses to give the shots, doctors to give the shots. Occasionally, city of San Diego firefighters did provide those. They provided a lot of them, in fact because they were paramedics and were licensed. But otherwise, we don't have doctors on staff for the city of San Diego. So we have been working closely with our county government. It's very hard to coordinate that sort of thing. It's frustrating to have to sign an MOU on every little project we have. So it's tough, but we've been working through it and we were relatively successful. In fact, I think objectively successful compared to other cities, other states in working together during the pandemic. Otherwise, it would be far worse right now. And I don't like to hang laurels on the type of sentiment of it could be far worse. I want to see it be far better. But when you put things in perspective, we did a good job. Last but not least, I will say that I have taken it upon myself to propose policies that make it easier for a family to remain in San Diego. A lot of folks are moving to other municipalities or even out of state. So I've been proposing uh, policies around child care, around parental leave, other economic development aspects supporting tourism and small business so that people stay here because we know they want to live in San Diego, but people are getting priced out of the market, mostly because of housing and because we don't have a good transit system, reliable transit system, like a lot of East Coast cities do. It's expensive to live here. It's expensive to drive here. It's expensive to go anywhere. It takes a long time to go places. So cost of living, quality of life, 
given how expensive it is, those are the things I'm personally focusing on. I wanted to ask you about the childcare because that's generally not an area that other than sort of permitting it in buildings, a city gets involved in, but you've really taken on that as a, as a key issue. Can you talk about, expand on why you believe childcare is so critical to your city's success? I think it's critical because we have a growing population and we have reduced numbers of childcare slots because of the pandemic. We had a lot of businesses go out of business. We had a lot of in-home caregivers who can use their, their apartment, their condo, their own home, whatever it is that they're living in to provide that service to nearby residents, members of their community, and run it as a business. So we saw a lot of those people go out of business. And now I'm trying to say, how can we improve that? With every single land use decision I bring up on the dais, where is the on-site child care going to be? When we're talking about transit infrastructure, I say, where are we going to have child care along this transit line so that families don't have to drive somewhere to drop their kids off, then drive to the transit and then jump on the transit to go to work? I bring that up a lot because that is the second most expensive item in most families' budgets after their rent or their mortgage. And because it's so slow and difficult to get land use decisions through, and it also requires the private sector in most cases to actually come forward with the housing to build, I said to myself, how can I drive down the cost of living as much as possible and keep people in the workforce as well? That is an important aspect of our economic development. We do not want families to feel like they are better off staying at home because they would simply be going to work to earn money to pay their child care and not be with their child. They would rather just stay with their child. And I want every family to have the choice of what they want to do. And part of that is making sure we have affordable and accessible and just a lot more slots of child care. And how's it going? Are you seeing some of those policies begin to increase the availability of child care? So in the first two years, we put in place a lot of the legal fundamentals to use city land to provide those slots and then start to form the relationships with either nonprofits or small businesses who would be able to use those public lands in order to provide the slots to the community. So we, as a city council, put onto the ballot what was called Measure H. It was to allow city parks and rec facilities that have additional office space and open space to be able to have child care on our parks and rec facilities. So our city charter only allowed parks to have a recreation center, open space, or a cemetery on that land. We said, okay, well, one of the biggest prohibitive costs for opening a child care center is having that open space because California law requires that when you have a certain number of kids over a certain age, you have to have open space for their exercise. So we have abundant parks in San Diego, in the city of San Diego. And so we asked the voters to change our city charter. It passed overwhelmingly with well over 70%. And so now we are in the process of implementing that. It's going to take another six, seven months. They passed in November and we're going to put in place a template for how nonprofit childcare providers can use our space, do tenant improvements on a rec facility, and ultimately have somewhere that's in the residential neighborhoods where parents often take their kids anyway to be able to have those childcare slots. Additionally, in my first year in office, I helped put together what's called an Office of Child and Youth Success. Many advocates had been proposing this for over a decade, but I was really instrumental in making sure we allocated the money to bring on a director and several program managers that would facilitate across libraries, parks, our internship program at the city, our junior lifeguards program, all sorts of programs that are aimed towards children and families, and bring that into one umbrella and make sure that everything is streamlined, that the public knows what those options are for their children, and ultimately to create the relationships so that in current city facilities like office buildings that we have right now, that we could get those renovated and hopefully get some child care slots out of them. That is a key component. So those fundamentals, the legal fundamentals are in place and we're working towards that. I've set a goal for myself to at least open up by the end of my first term, 250 child care slots throughout the city so that we could show that it works, then invest more money in it, and then build it from there. 250, I've been told by our director of child and youth success is a reasonable goal and that we can achieve that and then build from there. Uh, We have to start small because this is something, as you pointed out, cities don't oftentimes emphasize this or offer it at all. So we're building that infrastructure for the long term. That's fantastic. I hope other cities, including my own, frankly, use that as a model. These parks facilities 
they're a perfect place. As you said, they're adjacent to families or families are anyway. There's abundant outdoor space and, and you're really bringing a positive activation to some parks that may be underutilized or being utilized in unproductive ways and having that presence there is a benefit to the to the neighborhood whether people bring their kids there or not so it's smart i hope i hope you create that model get those 250 slots and then other cities can follow i didn't come up with the idea i'll tell you other cities have a similar office of child and youth success they call it different things but i don't think that the majority of them are focused on child care there's lots of great family focused programming in the city of San Diego and in other cities, but we gave them the mandate of working to find those slots. So I think that we're going to be ambitious in it and it's going to bring down the cost of living for our citizens. I really think it will. Hey everyone. I just want to take a moment to recommend another great podcast. It's called Sidebar. It's discussions with state and national experts about protecting our most critical individual and civil rights. The co-hosts are two law school deans, Jackie Gardina and Mitch Winnick. For more information on Sidebar, go to sidebarmedia.org or wherever podcasts are found. Now, back to our conversation. Fantastic. Can you talk a little bit about how you found yourself in this spot to be influencing childcare policy and so many other things in your city? What made you run for office and, and what was your path to public service? Well, I think I found myself in this position because I was listening to my constituents. They were explaining how difficult it was to secure childcare before the pandemic. I started running in 2019 for the 2020 election and I kept hearing about it, but I was always of the understanding that cities, especially the city of San Diego, doesn't focus on this. So when we finally got elected and we saw how many small businesses and nonprofits were closing up their childcare facilities and limiting their slots, particularly due to staffing, I said to myself, this is something that we need to focus on because it will have an immediate impact and reduce a lot of stress on families. And I think part of the reason I was focused on what families and children need is because before I went to law school and became an attorney, I was a Teach for America Corps member in North Las Vegas. I was a teacher for several years, fifth grade teacher. And so I have all my adult life been emphasizing what children need to succeed. And as much as this is focused as a program to make San Diego a family-friendly city, and we think about the the sheer cost of it and the economic trade-offs, for me, it's really that the children are getting that programming and that they are getting educated at an early age when their brains are still developing and that they can socialize in a, in a safe child care center, make friends, learn, and ultimately develop into successful adults. So I've been thinking about this as a sort of, well, it's just really a long-term strategy towards our economic development. But I also just know that kids really enjoy going to child care and, and learning with their teachers, with their instructors, and with, their, with the friends that they're making at a young age even more so in the pandemic when they were not interacting with other young children, toddlers, their age. So I think that's really what's been driving me. And when I picked up that mantle and ran with it, there were so many people who said that they've been waiting for someone in the city to champion it. And so we've got a ton of support from organizations like the YMCA, which is a large child par- child care provider here in San Diego, many, many other organizations that have been beating the drum for a long time. And so I'm excited that I get to lead on this issue, but I'm also excited that my fellow council members and the mayor have been supportive of it it as well and see it as a value add to our communities. Can you talk about you, as you, as you mentioned, you were a public school teacher, you were a deputy city attorney. What made you decide that serving an elected office is, is the best venue for your public service versus some of those other fields? That really comes from my family history. My parents grew up in the city of Calexico, which is about two hours east of San Diego in the Imperial Desert. It's right on the border with Mexicali, which is the capital of Baja California, Norte. And on the Mexican side, it's it's a city of well over a million now. But on the American side, it's still only a few t- tens of thousands. And back in the 70- 60s and 70s, it was even fewer. So, and it's an agricultural community as well. My grandfather was a small business owner, ran a liquor store and a gas station. My other grandfather was a radio announcer. And their involvement in local politics and in public service inspired the next generation of my my family. And then that eventually came to me when Cesar Chavez was campaigning to boycott 
folks who were mistreating farm workers. My grandfather was one of those big supporters of that movement. And so my family was close with the Chavez family as well. And so that was really a part of the legend of my family and really inspired me at a young age to think about public service, what's right, what's wrong, how to, how to really respect and treat workers. That eventually came down to me through my father. He's been an immigration attorney for 42 years, uh, has helped thousands and thousands of people immigrate to the United States, whether they're individuals or families or businesses bringing their workers here. So I grew up hearing those types of stories as well. All of that really inspired me to want to be in public service. And then in the 2000 election was the first one, I was 13 years old, the first one I really focused on and seeing the outcome of that and the really the the way the courts were involved, I really thought to myself, okay, it's it's more important to be involved in public service than to go be the second baseman of a professional baseball team. So as much as I loved baseball and always wanted to be a baseball player as a little kid, I really was 13 years old where I said, okay, this is going to be my path in life. And everything since then has really built up to being involved in that. When I moved home eventually, after a couple of years at a law firm in Los Angeles, after law school, I moved home in 2018. I wanted to get involved in local politics because I was, in, as you said, in the city attorney's office where I was getting gun violence restraining orders under our red flag law and in California. And the city of San Diego has been a big leader on that and trained many of the local law enforcement agencies across the state. So I worked on that team. I prosecuted DUIs, worked on drug possession and drug addiction cases, helping people get into many of the different treatment plans and plea deals that we have in San Diego and across the state of California. So all of that really built into my knowledge of the city government, together with the passion that came from my family, my own experiences campaigning throughout college and law school. It was just the right time to run. And I was really glad that for some reason, 40,000 people decided to vote for me. And here I am. (laughs) And what's been the most unexpected thing since serving in elected office? Certainly you you were adjacent enough to sort of see the job and understand the role and responsibilities of council members, but is there anything in the job that's been unexpected and that, or especially enjoyable? Well, I'd say the unexpected part is a little bit how calm our city council meetings have been. A lot of people are familiar with how out of control a lot of local agency meetings can get, public comment time. But because in California, the health and human services go through the county, that's where most of the most of the noise, I'll call it, has gone. We've had our share at the San Diego City Council, but very little. That means our meetings are are usually really well run, good public support, insightful comments, working on policy, collaboration between the nine council members we have, really strong relationship building in local government. I really think we are doing a strong job of putting forward competent and effective leadership at the moment. So I was kind of expecting that getting into office, we were going to see a lot of disruption, a lot of chaos. And luckily we haven't. And I'm thankful for that. Please, you know, I want it to stay that way. (laughs) You're lucky. I mean, compared to many of the guests on this podcast, you're extremely fortunate that civility has found a stronghold right now in San Diego. For sure. And and the most controversial things are are about what we control, like I said earlier, which is land use. We have a lot of folks who do not want to see upzoning and do not want to see expansion of housing in their particular communities, which I completely understand, but also knowing the affordability crisis we have with housing, we have to make strong moves for the future to make sure we have the housing stock that's necessary in the right places with the right amount of affordable, which is a lot of affordable, and making sure it's close to transit. Those are things I support. And so even those conversations around land use, they do not get out of hand. They stay civil. We have a local local group that proposes a lot of amendments to those sorts of zoning changes, and they bring the science to it. I'm actually really impressed with how detailed and thorough they are, the expertise they bring with professors and experts. But sometimes I disagree with them. Sometimes I agree with them. And it makes for good and better policy, I think. So don't by any means take it to mean that our comment periods are not invigorated. They certainly are. We just don't have a lot of name calling and we don't have a lot of costumes. I'll just say that. (laughs) Makes sense. Could you talk a little bit about that? San Diego's 
has been in California, certainly pushing the boundaries around zoning and density in ways that a lot of other cities haven't thus far. Part of that is pushed by state law, but part of that has been an active leadership by the leaders of San Diego to to do this. How do you think about these issues when you're pushing a community to change the density in their neighborhood and there's concern or resistance, but as you said, you're trying to find the right balance or trying to solve longer-term issues. How do you approach that when you may be out in front of where some of your constituents may be on this issue? Well, I try to listen first. That's what I try to do. I listen first. And when I hear particular types of arguments, I go straight at them and I'm honest and will explain why I disagree or what the support for my position is. The first thing that I hear is we don't need affordable housing in our neighborhood. And I say to myself, well, affordable is a definition based on the area median income, which is defined based on uh, federal housing standards at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so if we're talking 60% of the area median income in San Diego, the area median income is $109,000 for a family of four right now. So I say, let's go 60% of that. It's roughly $65,000. You know what? Families make $65,000. A lot of families. That's members of your community, like teachers and first-year police officers, nurses, librarians, a lot of people. So I make sure they understand that when they're saying something, that it's not just a talking point from next door, which is, I don't know if they have that all over the place. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I focus on my next door. I read the comments because I appreciate the good comments that come through in that. And I make sure that people understand the definitions well. As soon as I say that, they realize, oh, they didn't know that. And now they start to reassess. I feel very lucky that my constituents in District 7 of San Diego and all of San Diego, as soon as you start to present more of the evidence to them, they are actually very open-minded people. A lot of them actually have good responses to the evidence I propose with their evidence. The conversations are actually very good. Then I emphasize the fact that we actually have a good amount of expansion capability to densify our neighborhoods. And we have long-term plans to put in better transit in the city and in the region to help alleviate the traffic that many people are worried about. I never downplay any sort of either confusion or I don't downplay any of their concerns. I make sure that they know that we've taken that into account and that if they have a a serious concern, that sometimes their perspective of it is outsized. I bring them down to see it from my perspective. And I feel like a lot of people just appreciate the honest, forthright, direct conversations that we have. I have town halls in every single one of my five sort of subregions of my district instead of one large state of the district uh, address every year. And then I'm repeatedly at community councils, at planning groups, different local institutions we have that are have volunteer members of the community and speak with them directly. And I have staff at every single one of those monthly meetings as well. And so we're keeping our finger on the pulse and just addressing it head on. I know that there's lots of people who wish we could do more, but with state law, essentially implementing upzoning in lots of transit priority areas around town, they do understand that there's a lot that's out of my control. And they seem to appreciate that what is in my control, I go and advocate for. I like it. I'm going to ask you one question here that is maybe a little self-interested, which is if I had 24 hours to spend in San Diego, which I I hope to do (laughs) sometime soon, especially the more it rains and it's cold up here, what would you recommend for listeners when they visit your city? Just 24 hours? Just 24 hours. We'll keep you focused. Okay. When you say it that way, I know that it's really only like 11 usable hours in the day. So I'm going to say that the best thing you can do is go to Balboa Park, visit what is actually bigger than Central Park in New York City, and see the cultural heritage and the history of our city, whether it's art museums or rose gardens or live music or the Spreckles Oregon Pavilion, a lot of weddings photos being taken, uh, including mine last year, great restaurants. And we have what are called the international cottages, where we have dozens and dozens of small cottages where they're essentially the house of Mexico, the house of Finland, the house of Germany, the house of Iran, the, the house of the Philippines, all those put on almost every single day, a small exhibit and food. And then there's one big festival in December as well. But That, I feel, gives you the diversity and expanse of San Diego and Balboa Park. That 
should take you about four or five hours to get through all the way. If you don't, if you go to the San Diego Zoo, the world famous San Diego Zoo, add on another four right there, and that's your whole day. If otherwise, I'd say take a ride share or the bus right down to Petco Park for a Padres game because we are going to win the World Series this year. I'm calling it. All right. And we have Petco Park, which is recently rated the number one stadium in the country. Uh, it uses 100% renewable energy. I think it's the only stadium in America that does that. And then you're right down in the gas lamp and you have access to lots of great restaurants and culture. And I would take maybe in between the two of those, do a walk along Harbor Drive, go see our waterfront park that the county has and go to the USS Midway, the museum that is a, an aircraft carrier. And that is an excellent display of our military history in San Diego. And it's an incredible display of planes and the aircraft carrier itself. So I think those are really, really what I would focus on if all I had was one day in San Diego. If you had a second day, you want to come out to my district, go east about 12 miles, go to Mission Trails Regional Park, which is the largest urban park in all of California, with 60 miles of trails, five tall peaks and mountains, and the San Diego River running right through it with a visitor center that highlights the Kumeyaay contribution and history there and all the plants and animals. If you're a hiker and you want to get out into nature, there you could go spend an entire day of hiking or mountain biking as well, or some rock climbing as well. And then you'd see the suburban community of San Carlos and Del Cerro, where my wife and I live. I love it. I'm just now, now I'm extending my trip. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I really appreciate the work that you're doing in San Diego, especially around childcare. I look forward to following it and I look forward to trying to model it in our community and others. And so thank you for joining us today and thank you for being part of New Deal. My pleasure. I love being part of New Deal and all the people I meet, the support they give. And I'm happy to take those policies back here to San Diego and implement at the local level. Just like we're told, all politics is local. Well, I think all service is local and I appreciate New Deal support. Thank you. Thank you. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. Thanks to the team at New Deal for producing this episode. We encourage you to bring honor to public service and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars are used in the making of this podcast.